I came to photography kind of quite by accident um, when I was training as a soldier in Germany, getting preparing for the First World War. And we were asked to undertake some training uh, in photography in order to support um, the evidence collection units. By the time we got through, the, the Gulf War was, was pretty much done and dusted. It was, uh, the British involvement was pretty quick. So we were redeployed um, to Northern Ireland and the training came in very handy for assisting the IUC uh, for evidence collecting again and for scenes of crime, terror scenes of crime and such like. So when I was out there, within the first few weeks, I kind of realised that I wanted to, to use photography in, in, a, in a way to kind of, I guess to, to record my own experiences of, of the city, of the experiences of being an individual in uniform within that really hostile context as well. So I kind of wanted to do something in a, an official capacity to begin with, like a video, or, or sorry, an image diary, I guess. Um, but I wasn't allowed to do that. So I kind of did it anyway, but did it incognito. So I wrote home to my parents and asked them for a small compact camera and a couple of rolls of film. And it, it duly came about a week or so later, a little package arrived. So I kind of put this all together and, and hid the camera in my chest weapon. I put a little hole inside so the viewfinder could kind of be, be seen, but I could activate it. Even though looking through it, so I kind of just point my body into where what the competition would be and then kind of you know press this button. And I started making these images of, of kind of different events as they unfolded um, during the six-month tour. As the tour went on, I began to get more confident and my immediate team got wind of what I was doing with the camera. So it all became a bit more relaxed and I was able to then take the camera out and then give it to another member of my team to document me. Because like, one thing I realised was I wasn't in the scenes. I was always, it was always from my kind of perspective. And I guess, thinking back, that was kind of like a, a trophy photograph almost, really, because spotties, you know, generalised people from experience tend to love to have photographs taken of themselves in the uniform with the weapons, you know, in, in some kind of combat figures as well. So it was kind of all part of that boyish kind of macho kind of intervention, I guess, with the space. So that's how I initially got into photography. Um, I later started to do a, a degree down in chemistry about 10 years later. and, and Whatever reason, ten years seems to be a good time to, to think about revisiting one's history. I guess so. I went back to my former regiment um, to start a project off, just kind of initially looking at the ethos of, of the uniform male, I guess, and and the the way that these military institu institutions are organised, the infrastructure uh, behind them as well. And so the project starts the day after September 11th, and it finishes and um, the day before they due to depart to Afghanistan. So it's that kind of that in between what we don't often see because we often get image makers, photographers, photojournalists, you know, kind of we all see these stories of one of the, our boys on, on the front line and such like as well, but there's nothing really to kind of show the mechanics behind that and what happens at that build to one, how the guys are feeling, you know, and, it's, and how it's all kind of organised behind the scenes as well. So I think from that perspective that give it the work another layer and I think that's why the work's been kind of received so well is because it, it, it Kind of, I think it's a pretty unique position, and the fact it was created by a former soldier as well, who, using my kind of experience, kind of really brings something up into the to that work as well, like insider knowledge, so to speak. There's a political agenda with some of my work now as well, kind of criticizing, scrutinizing, um, some of the kind of the, I suppose, the agendas, um, and so with the work that I've been making now, it's out in the public domain it's easy for someone to come and kind of see what I've been making, where it's been shown and the nature of that work. So that kind of makes it somewhat difficult because the army now, like any other institution, has got really precious about how it's represented in, in the media and that's kind of part of the reason why I'm now working with, with soldiers who've come through that experience and I'm working more with veterans now actually and um, with some of the, the later projects. Um, a number of veterans collaborating with, with individuals who suffer from post-traumatic and stress disorder. So it's kind of starting to work with the recruits, kind of working through them, the army experience, and now on the, the flip side, that what happens when you're demobbed and kind of, you know, you're out of the army, um, but you're living with those experiences of what we made, especially in this context with Afghanistan and Iraq, which is becoming really the main focus of my work today. One of my agendas, one of the, the what I kind of saw on, on the website when I talk about my work is, is a recontextualizing of, of of the, the story of, of contemporary warfare 
Um, so I guess what I'm trying to do is, is I use a whole range of different visual strategies, you know, to engage different audiences um, and to, to kind of communicate things which they may be familiar with, but in a new way to kind of question some of those, those agendas and some of those concerns as well. So the work's been partly commissioned by NGCA um, and by the um, Arts, Arts Council England, who have had an input, and uh, also the uh, National Lottery Fund. Um, which I'm really grateful for their support because obviously the work wouldn't have happened without them. So I'm essentially putting an installation together of three related bodies of work. The first one is called Modern Warfare, which is using uh, commercially available uh, computer simulation software for military simulations. And it uses the same engine, software engine, what drives the combat simulators for both the US and the British Army. I'm working with veterans with their stories who have experienced these conflicts which are then often played by uh, the, the, a community who kind of make and modify this particular version of the, the, the software. So it's um, one of these kind of issues which I'm kind of working with is to engage a, a younger audience who are currently being targeted by recruitment campaigns from both the British and the US um, defence um, you know, defense agencies in order to um, secure the, the next generation of soldiers. That links on to the next piece of work, which is based on all source material from US military websites. So it's kind of looking at the goarmy.com website, which is the, the primary um, recruitment website for the US Army, and the um, airforce.com website as well, US Air Force. And it's, I find it really disturbing actually when you see how much it's geared for attracting and enticing um, teenage boys essentially who play video games. The graphics, the way that the design logos, the, the use of interactive elements, it's pretty shocking, I think, once you kind of see that stuff. And what I've attempted to do is to bring all of this together and recontextualize a, a number of these different um, recruitment strategies into an interactive ebook. So it's a multimedia interactive piece which will be presented in the gallery um, on a tablet. Because again, that's something that the technology is being used by the military now in order for the smartphone technology. So it's kind of a, a way of engaging a young audience with the technology what they already have and they use them. So that's what the kind of the youth and training, so to speak, with that. And then the final piece is a piece of work called Kill Zones, um, which is based on different arenas where individuals can take part in a, a grown phenomenon, a grown sport called Airsoft, which I only came across about a year ago. And it's part of my research and it's it's a really fascinating kind of subject in terms of, of why people kind of play this and the nature of the activity as well and um, people can pay up to about 40 50 pounds for an experience um, on military simulations where they'll spend a fortune actually the people players are really getting into it um, on authentic british or american army uniforms and then of course the replica and um, rifles and small arms which go with that as well and you can take part in different combat scenarios based on current events. But that's one thing that really attracted to me is the fact that we've got kind of, you know, British soldiers um, involved in, in action currently in Afghanistan. And then in a field somewhere in the UK, you can have up to 40 kind of individuals dressing up in the same uniforms and actually taking part in similar kind of scenarios using British Army um, tactics as well. And so I think it's a really fascinating area to kind of look at why people are, are are kind of taking part in this activity, but also the arenas in which they are playing as well. Um, so they can take place in, in military, former military institutions, um, it can be kind of a brownfield and um, sites which are kind of due for redevelopment, such like or areas of the kind of English countryside, um, a, a woodland for example, can be kind of become a skirmish site in that regard. So there's kind of a fascinating idea about this, these kind of locations in England for the main part. And how they've been transformed in these types of structures, the industry was built in there to represent something like it could be a bunker in Helmand province, and yet here it is in this lush green kind of, you know, environment. So that's kind of a, one of the, the big things what interested me was to kind of look at that separation between the reality of what's been pl uh, taking place in, in Afghanistan and how that's been played out, um, and, and the English landscape has been subjugated and transformed into this, into this kind of arena for. for Guess kind of a, a conflict where it becomes a leisure pursuit in that regard. So, and I think that raises some kind of ethical issues around that as well.
And the works are represented in five light boxes. And the idea with the light boxes, again, is to reference the, the screen technology. Um, because, again, some of these sites and the, the players often want to kind of, if they cut the next step from the, the Call of Duty um, or the Medal of Honor, so they're playing these computer games and simulations. Um, so, it, again, it blurs the boundary between kind of reality and, and fantasy, I guess, with this particular piece. There'll also be a, a replica SAA British Army issue with assault rifles on display, which is going to be part of the installation work. Um, and a number of patches, um, which individuals in the, the sport or the hobby, wherever they want to term it, um, can sew onto their uniforms. And it's kind of like a badge of honour. It says a lot about the individuals. So I've collected a lot from players who I've met um, whilst I've been looking around the country making the work. But I've also kind of purchased some um, online from UK shops to kind of a range and a kind of feel of, of kind of the ethos, I guess, of the players and um, the, the different clubs that have, have kind of partaken in this activity. I think inevitably when you're doing anything lens-based, then you are removed in that sense. As soon as you look through that viewfinder and you take that step back from, from reality. But in, in terms of the way the work's presented, it, it's, it's fundamental that it links in to the, the, the references, either using screen technology or referencing it with the light boxes as well. So, and, and to make the work immersive in that sense, so it becomes, it becomes more screen, so the idea of the, the projection with the audio, the way it's going to be structured, um, so it'll kind of change as you move through that, that piece of work, and the, the, the scale of that projection as well, will make it more of an immersive experience, and it's somewhat like the scale of what it would be for a, a British uh, soldier going through a um, training exercise within that, uh, a particular kind of military simulation environment.